Wine Stories, a podcast to discover the world of wine by Etienne Pommier. In the podcast today, the second part of the Rudy Cornierwan case, the most famous wine forger in history. In the first part, I told you how he pulled off his scam from the moment he arrived in the United States to his first step into the world of wine. Then there were the years of plenty between luxury shopping and record-breaking sales until his downfall in 2012 and his conviction for fraud. But as Rudy goes back to prison, many questions remain unanswered. Was Rudy truly gifted and a tasting genius? Where did the money he used to start buying and counterfeiting come from? Did he really craft all these bottles on his own in his kitchen, or did he have accomplices? And what about the merchants, experts and collectors who sold, vetted and praised these improbable wines over the years? Were they the victims of the counterfeiter, or did they enable him or even help him for their own profit? To answer all these questions, understand the mechanisms of this case and discover where the actors of this story are today, here is the second part of this podcast about Rooney Cordia One, the fine wines counterfeiter. In 10 years, Rudy Cornia One has sold thousands of bottles to private collectors, merchants, or during auctions for millions of dollars, and some estimates suggest a total of $150 million. How did he manage to build for himself the reputation of a high-profile collector able to locate the rarest bottles on the market? How did Rudy Cornia One succeed in scamming wine merchants with years of experience, long-time collectors, and leading wine critics? He did have remarkable social skills and a sharp understanding of human psychology, like all great con men. But the most frequent explanation for the trust people placed in him is his supposed extraordinary ability in tastings that made him a wine genius. So is it true? Blind tasting is a difficult exercise that typically requires a long learning process to train one's palate in perceiving all the nuances between varieties, terroirs, and vintages, as well as an excellent taste memory to store all that information. If the technique can be acquired through practice, a person gifted with an exceptional ability to remember taste, balance, and texture in wine has it all to become a super taster, just like a musician who has perfect pitch. In the words of some of his former friends, Rudy was a tasting genius, and Jeffrey Levy, aka Hollywood Jeff for the Twelve Angry Men, explains. He was never wrong. He was incredible. One day, I invited him to my place, and I poured him wines from Burgundy, Bordeaux, Italy, and Spain. He would either find the country, the vintage, the producer, or be really close. He was truly gifted. But should we take at face value the opinion of a collector who was one of the fraudster's main victims, or is Cornia One's supposed genius a way for his old friends to distract observers from the fact that they have been scammed by a 25-year-old newcomer? Other testimonies from sommeliers support this story, and even Burgundy producer Etienne de Monti describes him as a UFO. Whether he was a genius or not remains unclear, but Cornierwan did seem to be a talented wine taster, and it is this talent that allowed him to brew mixtures that deceived his guests on so many occasions. Rudy's tasting notes were presumably so good that his friends John Capon, the auctioneer of Ackermerl and Condit, started using them in his sales catalogs. But when I tell you stories about these high-end tastings, you may imagine a solemn and soft-spoken atmosphere with connoisseurs focused on their wine glasses to decipher the world's greatest wines. Forget it. Cornier wine and Capon dinners weren't like that at all. It was loud with people bragging and drinking so much that they barely had time to actually enjoy the wines being served. In the documentary Criminals 2.0 Rudy Cornier One, directed by Elsa Leretier, produced by Nicolas Vallot for Let's Speaks, and aired in France on July 7, 2015, collector Douglas Barzelay recalls. He would be, you know, one of these dinners where they would say, empty your glass of latage because Romane Conti was coming. It was ridiculous. 
after maybe two evenings, I stopped going. In order to give you a better idea of what these dinners truly were, here is an overview of the wines served in September 2007 at 11 Madison Park, a three Michelin star restaurant in New York. For cocktail, 1973 Dom Perignon Onotech, 1997 Gigal Cotrotti La Turque, and 2001 Hermitage Ex Voto. Then, four champagnes, including Laurent Perrier Grand Siècle 1961. Then three more flights of champagne from the 1964 vintage, including Tetanger Comte de Champagne, Louis Rodreur Crystal, and Dom Perignon. Then, another flight of Bordeaux 1952, featuring Mouton Rothschild, Chateau Margaux, and Chateau Latour, followed by another set, including 1959 Pavie and 1950 L'Evangile. Then another flight of Burgundy 64, with Romane et Saint-Vivant and Chambertin Grand Cruz. And then again champagne for dessert. Overall, 32 bottles for 12 guests. According to John Capon, one must drink and drink a lot in order to learn. His motto, inebriation is education. I leave it for you to ponder on the quality of the tasting notes at the end of such an evening. In fact, Capon is not exactly known for the finesse and poetry of his writings, often wordy and crude. For instance, about Chateau Ozone, Saint-Emilion, 1921. Sheer sex on the nose. And to describe a 1945 DRC Richbourg, if wine were a drug, this would be crack. We are miles away from the quiet elegance of Bordeaux chateaus and the peaceful calm of Burgundy cellars. Another burning question that the trial only partly answered is the money. Where did Rudy's money come from? How did he manage to operate for a decade, spending huge amounts to fund his lavish lifestyle made of sports cars, luxury suits and watches, and $50,000 evenings in the finest restaurants? In court, Kornjawan was also convicted with wire fraud towards the company Fine Art Capital for a $2.5 million loan in 2008. The art pieces submitted by Rudy as security were already used as collateral on another loan. When the company realized it, the pieces were seized and sold to repay Kornjawan's debts. Because at that time, behind the successful facade of the young collector showing off in New York and Los Angeles, lies a man in dire straits, desperate for money. In the end of 2007, only a year after the two famous sales The Cellar 1 and 2, which earned him $35 million, Rudy still owes $15,500 to the auction house. Between the first and the second sale, John Capon wired over $8.5 million to Rudy Kornjawan. Was it payment in advance on the second sale? Why did Rudy need so much money? Another point remains unclear. In 2008, when Fine Art Capital checks Rudy's background, since he has no salary and no regular income, they contact Ackermerrill and Condit to see if he's trustworthy. One of the partners, Barbara Chu, will testify in court that John Capon explained to her over the phone that Rudy was a serious client who had sold over $30 million worth of wine with him. But Capon fails to mention that in this very moment, Kornia One owes him over $10 million. Such forgetfulness seriously questions the true nature of the relations between the fraudster and the auction house that, after his arrest, will always claim to be a victim. Given Rudy Konyawan's record sales, one can only wonder about his personal finances and maybe his taste for luxury goods doesn't explain the millions of dollars he had in debts. Where did the money go? Did Rudy have to pay other people? The investigators found two wire transfers towards Indonesia for $12 million to a Dar Saputra and $5 million to a Teddy Tan without being able to establish the true identity of the recipients. It will later appear that Dar Saputra is an alias Rudy used to sell some wines. So was he just sending money abroad to cover himself or did he have debts to repay? Debts that would have forced him to get fresh money by all means on July 25th, 2007, he sends an email to one of his collector friends begging him to lend him some cash. Hi Dave, 
I'm just really in need of three mil to pay bills immediately in really deep, deep shit. Can you help me while we wait on others? Only if this is not in your way for whatever reasons, I completely understand. Please advise ASAP at your convenience. Thanks, Rudy. P.S. Please don't get pissed at me. We'll never know if Rudy did receive the money. But the tone of this email is that of a man with his back against the wall, looking for any option to save himself. But save himself from what exactly? Where did the money that allowed him to start his operation come from? Did someone send him large sums he wasn't able to pay back? Is there someone else behind Rudy Kurnia one? There may be some leads in his family history, and I need to pause here for a moment to tell you about one of the largest bank robberies of all times. Kurniawan's mother had two brothers, Tan Cho Hing, a.k.a. Endra Raja, and Tan Cho Hong, a.k.a. Eddie Tensel. During the 1990s, during the dictatorship of President Suato, Endra Raja was the CEO of two of the largest banks in Indonesia, Bank Harpan Sentosa and Bank Guna International. During the 1997 financial crisis, both banks went bankrupt and Raja fled the country. Indonesian authorities then discovered that he emptied his client's account for over $600 million. Convicted in absentia in Jakarta, Interpol issued a red notice against him and he finally got arrested in 1999 at Sydney Airport. Jailed by the Australians waiting for a possible extradition, he died of cancer in his cell on January 23, 2006. At the time of his death, his wealth was estimated around $9 billion concealed in tax havens. His brother, Eddie Tensel, was sentenced in 1994 to 17 years in prison for a $420 million fraud committed against another Indonesian bank. In 1996, he bribed his way out of prison and later reappeared in southern China, where he was involved in another scheme against Bank of China for $47 million. Located in Macau in 2015, he apparently lives under a fake name in the former Portuguese colony. If no direct links could be established between Rudy and his uncles during the investigation, this family picture with a fraudulent wealth measured in billions of dollars can only make us wonder about the true origin of Rudy's first money. For many years, Rudy Kornia One was funded by money from shady sources as well as numerous loans. But why were private clients and merchants ready to lend money to a collector who supposedly had a bottomless seller? They could have told him that if the collection was so vast, he could just sell a part of it to get back on his feet. But the key to this case is to understand that Rudy could only keep operating for so long because many others had interest to see him continue starting by the brokers and auction houses who worked with him, as well as some wine critics. Brokers and auction houses would earn their commission on every sale made by Cornia One, which allowed them to earn a lot of money. After the story went public, all the merchants involved explained that they didn't know that the bottles were counterfeited. And while some of them have indeed been taken advantage of, others have displayed a blatant carelessness in their sourcing. Let me just give you one example. In June 2011, a case of 1966 Romani County, presumably original, is sold by Heritage Wine Auctions for over $100,000. But here's the catch. This case is a perfect example of how some merchants choose to turn a blind eye since it is a gross forgery with bottles of different heights and shapes and even different glass colors. The sale is eventually cancelled and the case sent back to its owner. In December 2011, a new lot of 1966 Romani County is being offered by Spectrum Wine Auctions in Hong Kong, and another one in February 2012 in London during the Spectrum and Vanquish sale. The Hong Kong bottles will be sold quietly, while the London lot will be pulled out of the sale after comments on the Wine Berserkers blog revealed that these bottles were the same as the ones sold by Heritage in June 2011. Since the supposedly original case of Romani Conti could not be sold in one go, 
it was split into different lots to conceal the differences in bottle shapes and colors and sell it in different marketplaces. So these bottles have gone through the hands of three auction houses in three different countries without being flagged as questionable by companies who will then explain that they were being taken advantage of. Seriously? But the main auction house pointed out in this case is obviously Ackermerrill and Condit in New York, run by John Capon. Like all auction houses, Acker charges a premium around 20% on the hammer price of the wine. Capon's idea to enter the world of auctions was to shake things up in the old-fashioned models of the likes of Christie's and Sotheby's. Tailored suits, wood-paneled salons of prestigious hotels, and soft-spoken atmosphere of seasoned collectors and professional buyers. Houses had been traditionally charging 15% on both the buyer and the seller of the wines. Capon changed the commission system to charge only buyers, which allowed him to capitalize on the existing Acumeral database of long-term clients to offer more collections for sale. But most importantly, for his first auction, he chose a restaurant, a more casual atmosphere, and which is key, the service of wines during the sale. Between two sessions, he would walk around the room offering potential buyers to sip a glass of wine while browsing the catalogue. Would you prefer to taste the 1991 Musini Comte de Vaugray or the 1982 Bilcar Salmon Blanc de Blanc in Magnum? He understood that buyers would be more inclined to raise their paddles after a few glasses of fine wines. And it worked. But what made his business reach a whole new level are the two auctions of Rudy's sellers, as collector Douglas Barzolet points out. Before those two sales, John was selling some very nice stuff, but it was smaller consignment, onesies and twosies. The reality is that Rudy was integral to that leap that his business made. So the more record sales Ackermerrill could do with Rudy's magic seller, the more profit the New York auction house was earning. And the first doubts that emerged concerning Rudy's wines did not alert Acker at all, and the firm continued to sell them. On August 15, 2007, John Capon posted another note on a wine forum defending Rudy and explaining that he was an authority on old vintages, paying a lot of attention to ensure all his bottles were authentic. Only three months before this post, Christie's had to pull out of an auction in Los Angeles two magnums of 1982 Le Pin consigned by Rudy Cornia One. In April 2008, when Capon features on his catalogue vintages of Domaine Ponceau never seen before, he doesn't even call the producer to check if they have indeed been produced. And when Laurent Ponceau calls him before the sale to inform him that the bottles are counterfeit, here is what Capon has to say. All these bottles have been authenticated by experts. Okay, so can you please tell me the names? Ponceau asks. I am the main expert. But do you know who you are talking to right now? I am Laurent Ponceau, the owner of Domaine Ponceau, and I am telling you that these bottles are fake. Capon eventually agrees to take them out, but Ponceau isn't so sure, and it is only when Capon is told on the auction day that the producer is in the room that he ends up pulling them out of the cell. It is most likely that if Laurent Ponceau had not been physically present in New York on April 25, 2008, the bottles would have been sold. After the Ponceau incident, Rudy's reputation is seriously damaged. But Capon insists and says in an interview, I really cannot see Rudy doing that. That would be criminal. But at the same time, he doesn't have any questions when Konya Wan asks his company to find 100 to 200 cases of cheap 1980s Bordeaux. A rather unusual purchase for someone who claims to drink only the best stuff. It becomes more and more difficult for Acker and Rudy to sell wines in the United States, so they have to find another market to operate in. But that's not a problem for Capon, who has an idea. Hong Kong has just abolished the import tax on wines and the concentration of wealth in the former British colony opens great new opportunities for the auctioneer. The Chinese clientele, rich, thirsty for fine wines and supposedly less knowledgeable than European or American buyers in his mind, will be prepared to pay big money to buy these rare bottles. In 2009, Acker organizes four auctions in Hong Kong that represent 50% of the company's global turnover that year. 
and in 2010, it will be six sales for over 75% of Acker's volume of business. I was in Hong Kong in those years, and in spite of the warnings that I and other merchants could send to clients, there was such a desire to be part of this booming market that most people completely ignored the red flags about Acker and Rudy's wines. In his book, In Vino Duplicitas, Peter Hellman suggests that Capon, without being an accomplice, maybe didn't want to see what was happening because the business was too good. In my opinion, that may be giving him more benefit of the doubt than he deserves. But I leave it to you to make up your own mind on the matter. In fact, if Capon could not be called on the stand during the trial because he was not on American soil, it's probably just a coincidence. But wine merchants and auction houses were not the only ones to benefit from Rudy's business and to turn a blind eye. A client asking to keep an empty bottle open in the restaurant for sentimental reasons or for his private collection, that happens all the time, and it's completely understandable. But when the same client repeatedly asks the same restaurants on multiple occasions to send him back all the bottles unwashed and with all the corks, Maybe that could have set some restaurant managers thinking? A famous critic specialized in Burgundy wines, Alan Meadows, did participate in several dinners with Cornia Wine and Capon. I have personally met Mr. Meadows on several occasions, and during my time in Hong Kong, I even worked on an event he was hosting with my company. I do not challenge the honesty and sincerity of his notes, and I believe he was deceived during some tastings and believed that what was in his glass was genuine. Nobody's perfect, and I may as well have taken notes on wines that were not what they pretended to be. That being said, when Meadows agrees to host tastings in 2010 in Asia with John Capon before the Acker auction of Eric Greenberg's collection, he cannot ignore the multiple press articles reporting the investigation on counterfeit wines the collector faces. In this case, it seemed that it was more convenient and better for business for many people to stay quiet and turn a blind eye, even if it was at the expense of their work ethics. The most difficult question is that of the accomplices. Did Cornia One operate on his own, or did he get help from third parties? Was the kitchen in Arcadia the source of all the bottles, or merely a lab making prototypes for larger-scale production somewhere else? Laurent Ponceau, who investigated for two years and will publish a book on his quest, asserts that Rudy received help from numerous accomplices in Asia and in Europe. Other observers have suggested that Rudy, by himself, could produce a 100 bottles a day. We know that Rudy Cornia I had labels printed in Indonesia and that he bought bottles from negotiations in Burgundy and elsewhere, but to this day, no complicity could be established. During the 2000s, Rudy probably sold over 20,000 bottles directly or via intermediaries and merchants all around the globe. Many of these wines have been resold or consumed without the final clients knowing the provenance and fraudulent nature of the bottles. This further damaged the reputation of the counterfeited domains who are, alongside the oblivious customers, the main victims in this case. Most likely, the majority of Rudy's bottles are still out there, and I come across some of them once in a while during an inspection. The Cornia One case caused considerable turmoil in the fine wines and old vintages market. However, and unfortunately, it did not bring counterfeiting to an end, on the contrary. The growth on the secondary market, fueled by these thousands of bottles sold in the US, in Hong Kong or elsewhere, has brought fine wine prices to even higher levels, thus rendering counterfeiting even more lucrative for criminals. Since Cornia One's arrest, several other cases have been revealed, but these are stories for another day. On November 7th, 2020, Rudy Cornia One, in main number 62,470-112, was freed from Reeves Correctional Facility in Texas and eventually deported to Indonesia in April 2021. What remained of his possessions was sold to pay off some of his debts and the fake bottles seized in his home have been destroyed. Two years ago, an importer friend of mine based in Jakarta sent me a picture taken during an Argentinian wine dinner. The face looks a little older, the hair is now grey, 
but one can still easily recognize Rudy, with a glass in his hand, addressing a melancholic smile to the camera. He is now 47 years old. John Capon is still a Cameron and Condit CEO, and the company has been hosting its last sale in Hong Kong only last weekend on September 23rd. They haven't changed their practices a bit, and in 2021, the company paid a $100,000 fine in order not to lose its liquor license after having sold fake bottles of bourbon in New York. Laurent Ponceau has left the family domain to launch his own negotiation house in 2017. In 2013, he declared in an interview to Wine Spectator, of all the old Burgundy wines made by renowned producers from the 1970s and before, 80% are counterfeit. The book, telling his side of the Cornia wine story, is due to be published in France this fall. In conclusion, I wish to read you part of a tasting note taken by Rudy Cornia wine on a very old 1899 Burgundy wine, this one confirmed authentic, which weirdly echoes with the destiny of the counterfeiter. It's certainly fading, but fading is different from past its peak. I don't think this will ever dry out. It's just going to vanish one day. You'll wake up one morning and it will be gone.